Welcome to the 11th chapter of Systematic Theology. We're going to be looking at the character of God, incommunicable attributes today. If this is the first time you're joining us, you can get the other chapter previews on YouTube at Hear the Bible Speak. There are also some on fasting and on uh, knowing how to become a believer in Jesus Christ and to follow him. So we welcome you. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you are with us on Thursdays and missed the in-person, we really miss you. We, we really hope to see you soon. We're glad you're here with us, though, today for this post. Uh, so let's get started with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what a magnificent honor to be in your presence today. I pray, Father, that you enlighten our hearts to what you want us each to learn about you today. I pray for every lady, for every man that sees this, that hears this, that their relationship with you would deepen through the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrected Christ. Father, teach us your word that we may apply it in our day to day and throughout this week, that we may latch on to it and it may come a part of our very existence. Because, Father, our goal is to be into Scripture, to study Scripture, to delve into it so that we get to know you better because that's where we learn. Father, I pray that um, you guard my mind and my mouth today that I speak your words clearly and we give all praise to your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Observe. That's what we're learning to do is to observe God. We will be doing that our whole lives. We will do it all the way through eternity because to observe God is to know God. And to observe God means that we are continuing to build this relationship with God. So we want to observe him. A prayer that I enjoy praying that has meant a lot to me is God grant that I see truly today because your truth. Open my mind and open my eyes at every point to see the reality that your word and you, your world are meant to reveal. Amen. At every point in my day, I want to see God's reality. We talked last week about God being objective. He is outside of us. His reality, his perspective, his truth is what we are observing. As we study today and every day his word, we are looking and we are observing what does God's perspective look like? What does his reality and his truth look like? Because I want to match up to that. So we pray that because we read all the way through scripture. John 14, 15, and 16 and Luke asked me, and I will give it to you. Anything that we ask in God's uh, will. And his will is for us to know him. And to be in relationship with him. He grants. He answers. And so we ask him today. Father, truly show us today you. God's attributes. Otherness. Holy. Whole complete, infinite. His attributes go on and on and on. Merriam-Webster's defines attributes as a quality, a character, a characteristic ascribed to someone or something. So we, when we read scripture, when we listen to sermons, when we read um things that help us references concordances that teach us about God we are looking at his character we are looking at his attributes because we want to learn what God is like that's called relationship when I am learning about God and God is allowing that to happen and he always will we are being in relationship with God that's the second part of a observation it 
we begin to understand God through that relationship. Incommunicable attributes, that's what we're going to learn about today, are attributes or characteristics that God does not share with us. He doesn't communicate with us those attributes. Those are God's alone. Those are his characteristics, and we're going to look at that today. Next week, we'll start two parts on communicable. Those are attributes that God does share with us. He does communicate them with us. So let's get started. Incommunicable attributes that God does not share with us. He doesn't communicate them to us. When incommunicable attributes are described by Grudem in this chapter, chapter 11, it's going to be in a two-part sentence. The first part of the def sentence defines the attribute that we're going to talk about. The second part of the sentence guards us against misunderstanding that attribute by stating a balancing or opposite aspect that relates to that attribute. And I'm going to show you what that looks like so that when you read chapter 11, you're going to have a better understand how, understanding how Grudem explains the attribute. Each description of God's attributes must be understood in the light of everything that Scripture tells us about God. We do not take one Scripture out of the Bible and focus simply on that because sometimes that will lead us astray. We have to take all Scripture from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation and bring them together on that topic so we have a complete view of God when it is describing that attribute. We do not want to take an attribute out of context. Understanding. This is key. After we observe God, after we watch what he says about himself in his word, we want to understand God's reality. We know what our reality is. We live in it. It's all about me. We talked about that last week. But now that we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, bought by his blood, live eternally, through him and the finished work on the cross that he has done. We are learning more and more and more about what it's like to live in God's reality, to live in God's truth and God's perspective. That's understanding God, and we will do it through this life all the way through eternity because God is infinite. We will never know everything there is to know about God, and that is exciting. God teaches us about himself every day, what we do is we observe him. We ask him in relationship, God, I want to agree with you. I want to agree with your reality, your truth, and your perspective. And for me to agree, I want to begin to understand in a deeper way. The first incommunicable attribute is independence. That means God is totally independent of anything in anybody, God has absolutely no need for anything besides himself because he is whole, he is perfect, he is complete. That may disturb you because we want God to need us. We want God to want us. But I want to introduce a question. If God needed us, there would be a hole in God that is not filled. That means God would be incomplete. And if that is so, then God is not an almighty God. There would be something lacking in him. And we know there's nothing lacking in God. Grudem said, God does not need us or the rest of creation for anything. He is describing the attribute of independence. Yet... We and the rest of creation can glorify him and bring him joy. So scripture tells us completely that God is independent. But scripture also tells us that his creation and you and I glorify him. We can glorify him. We can bring him much joy. So let's look at this. In Acts 17, 24 through 25. And please turn with me in your Bible. 
The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God is complete. He is outside of us. He is otherness. He is holy. He has no need for us. He gives us life and breath and everything. In Psalm 50, 10 through 12, we read, For every beast of the forest is mine. That's what God is saying. The cattle on a thousand hills, they're mine. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the fields. That's mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. God is not in need. If God was in need, then he would be lacking something. An almighty God cannot be almighty if he is lacking something because that means something else would have to be able to fill that void and nothing is bigger than God. God does not need us for anything, yet the amazing fact of our existence is that he chooses to delight in us and to allow us to bring joy to his heart. Oh my goodness. He allows us to bring joy to his heart. He chooses us so that we can delight in him. He doesn't need us. He doesn't want us. He chooses us. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. God will save us. God will rejoice over you. You with gladness. God chooses to rejoice over you. Do you realize the the absolute complete gladness and joy you bring to God's heart? And he will also quiet you with his love and by his love. He will give you peace. He chooses to do that. God will exalt over you with loud singing. Can you imagine? God calls you. He sings over you. He loves you so much that right now in the heavens, God is singing loudly over you and you will be able to hear him call your name when we get to the other side. That's how much God loves you. God calls you eternally significant. He is the one that makes you eternally significant. There is nothing bigger than their God. There is nothing bigger. There is nothing outside of God that can do what God does. And the God of all creation, of all things, comes and he says, You, you individually, will have eternal significance because I have deemed it. I have ordained it. No greater personal significance can be imagined. Nothing. You are eternally significant to God. In his independence, he says, I am whole, I am complete, and I deem you eternally significant. The next incommunicable attribute is unchangeableness. Grudem says, God is unchanging in his being, his perfection, his purposes, and his promises. So that's an attribute that we do not share with God because we change continually. That's what life is. is. It is a continuation of changing because when we change, we learn and we grow and we move. But God does not change because if he does, that would mean that he is changing into something that he was not before. And if God is almighty and God is greatest and God is the largest and God is everything, he lacks nothing. Yet, the second part of the sentence is, God does act 
God does feel emotion and he acts and he feels differently in response to different situations. So just because God is unchanging, that means his purposes are always, always sound. They are always in his will. His will will never change, but he acts and he feels, which means he has emotions in response to different situations. So what are we talking about, Sharon? Hebrews 1, 10 through 12 says, And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe, you'll roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years have no end. God does not change through time because God is outside of time. We change because we are finite. God is infinite. We change because we change with successions of moments. God responds differently to different situations. Let's look at that. We read in Jonah 3, or God talked to Jonah and he said, I want you to go to Nineveh. These people have turned from me. They are pagans. And I want you to tell them that in so many days that I'm going to destroy them. And Jonah goes to Nineveh and he tells God that. He tells the people that. That God is going to destroy them if they do not change. God's purposes... God's being, God's perfection, and God's promise was that if the people in Nineveh did not change, destruction was coming. Then we read in Jonah 3.10, When God saw what they did, that's the people in Nineveh, how they turned from their evil ways, the people in Nineveh heard the message Jonah said. They repented. They turned course. They changed their evil ways. God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God's being, his perfection, his promises, purposes and promises did not change. They were going to be destroyed, but the situation changed. They turned and acted differently, and because they acted differently, God acted differently. That did not change his purposes or his promises. God is personal and he relates to us personally and counts us as valuable. God is a loving God. God is a just God. God is personally involved with our lives. He counts us valuable because he deemed us valuable. Prayer changes situations. Prayer itself is a part of a new situation. We change situations by praying. Go with me to Exodus 33. In Exodus 33, God was so upset with the Israelites. They had turned and turned and turned from him on every corner. He was ready to give up. He said, okay, and go with me to verse 12. He he speaks to Moses and he's so upset with them, with the Israelites. And in verse 12, then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray to you, God, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your way, ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses is telling God, don't desert your people. God has told him, I am not going with them. No more. And Moses said, no, you have told me that I, me, Moses, have found favor in your sight. I don't want to go unless you tell me who's going to go with me. 
And God said to Moses in verse 14, My presence shall go with you, Moses, and I will give you, Moses, rest. Then Moses said to God, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? Moses is interceding for he, for the Israelites. He's not separating himself off. God has said to him, Moses, I want to take you. We're going to start over. We're not going to take those people. It's going to be you. I am going to give you rest, and we're going to do this differently. And Moses said, no, I am not separating myself from your people. You have to go with us. We will not go. I will not go if you don't go with us. And then verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do these things of which you've spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. God changed, he relented his actions towards the people because Moses prayed. That did not change God's purpose. It did not change God's being. It did not change his promises. He always wanted the people to come to him. Moses interceded for the people Moses prayed. Moses changed the situation by prayer. Please let me tell you how important prayer is. You who listen to this that say, but I've been praying for years and decades and I don't see the change. Have faith. Pray to God for faith, to have faith. Romans 1, 16 and 17. God, please give me the faith to be diligent, to commit, to continue to pray for something that I don't see and believe that you are working and that you are acting. Unchangeableness. God's present displeasure and sorrow in the long term would achieve his good purposes. God does have displeasure. He was very displeased with the Israelites when he talked to Moses. He was very displeased with the Ninevites when he was telling Jonah to go to him and tell him he was going to destroy them. God was in sorrow because the, the people had turned from him. But in the long run, God's plan would be achieved. So God has emotion. He can feel sorrow. He can feel displeasure. That does not mean that his purposes and his promises and his being are changed. In Genesis 6, 6, God said, And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. That does not mean that he hated mankind, that he wanted to completely destroy all mankind. But he was sorrowful that mankind did not love him. He was sorrowful. He regretted their sin. It was a great displeasure to him. It grieved him to his heart. But his plan was always for redemption. His plan and his promises was always, always for him to send his son to buy, buy back those who would repent, those would, who would return and who would love him. God does have sorrow. God does have emotion. Yet God is unchangeable. The next attribute we look at is eternity. God has no beginning end or succession of moments in his own being and he sees all time equally vividly yet God sees events in time and he acts in time this is amazing God equally and vividly sees every single moment 
nothing, no second, no moment in your life is not important to God. When you wake up in the morning and you have a cup of coffee and you're still in a fog and you don't even remember, all of those moments are vivid and equal to God because everything is important to God because he deems it important. Remember a time when you were in a situation and you thought, I never want to forget this. And yet, as the succession of moments, as time moves on, you forget details. You forget the feelings, the emotions. You forget how clear everything was in that moment. That's not God. God sees everything always perfectly vividly and clearly. God does not look through sin. That's why it's so important for us to look at truth. That's his truth, his reality, his perspective. Because when he looks at every single thing, it's perfection. He is not manipulated like we are by our habits, by how we were raised, by inheritance, by our experiences. He sees it perfectly. He sees our intentions and the motivations of our heart. Yet God sees events in time and he acts in time. He is with us this very second. He's with you listening to this cast, to this post. He is with you with your piece of paper and your pen and your note writing and your Bible open. And he sees vividly. He's here with me as I teach and I lead you to delve into his scripture he's with my mouth to speak these words and he will never forget this he is not like us time and moments do not dim from him god sees everything in time in revelation 1 through 8 god says i am the alpha and the omega says the lord god who is and who was, and who is to come. I am the Almighty. Jesus' bold use of the present tense verb when, when he says this implies continued present existence. There is never a time from all eternity past through the present, through all eternity future, to where he is not presently existent. Fully vivid, fully, equally, everywhere at all times. Jesus holds a presence at all stages of time. He, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all present at all time. Never, never not with us. Second Peter 3, 8 says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God is vivid in his thoughts. He sees everything. All time is equally vivid to God and complete clarity as it, if it just happened. No event ever ceases to be visible to God's mind. eternity Romans 8 29 through 30 says for those whom he foreknew he also predestined do you see the time there was a in our existence he foreknew us in his existence outside of time he foreknew us he predestined us do you see at different periods of time in our lives he saw us clearly and vividly he is conforming us that is our salvation to the image of his son and he will conform us throughout eternity to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren that's the son he is the firstborn of all of God's children and those whom he predestined he called And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he will glorify. At every point of time, God is equally and vividly present. In Revelation 22, 20, he says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. 
God looks at time differently than we do. It's qualitatively different. One year is as a thousand and a thousand is one. Time is quality of moments. Begin to learn how to live in the present. Each moment is important. It's you and God in this relationship. Each moment to God is infinitely important because you are being conformed to the image of his son. God loves you. He never leaves you. You are never alone. Omnipresence. Another incommunicable attribute of God. God does not have size or spatial dimension in his presence at every point of space with his whole being. Yet God acts differently in different places. Psalm 139, 7 through 10 says, Where shall I go from your spirit? David asked, Or where shall I flee from your presence, God? If I send to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which at that time was hell, or a, a, a place like hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hands can lead me, shall lead me, and your hands shall hold me. God is everywhere all the time. This thought process that God's not with me is a lie from Satan. God never leaves you. His presence is everywhere all the time. When we, I've heard people say, I, I'm not going to pray about that. God's got bigger fish to fry than that. God's got children in St. Jude's Hospital dying of cancer. There are people with much bigger problems than I. God's busy doing other things bigger than I. That is a lie from Satan. God loves you. He has called you eternally significant because he is God. He has deemed you important, significant to him. You are never alone. He is with you at all times. God gives us his full attention at all times and in all places. God cannot be contained in any one place. We cannot put God in a box. God is present everywhere, but is also distinct from his creation. In today's world, we hear a lot that God is in the rocks and he's in the mountain and God is in the trees and God is in this and that. That's called pantheonism. God is separate from his creation. God works in our lives because we have chosen to believe in his son and Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. His blood shed, the wrath of God poured on him for our sin. We acknowledge him as Lord of our lives and he comes and he dwells within us. But he is distinct. He is otherness. God can be present to punish, sustain, or to bless. To bless in John 4, 20 through 21, he's talking to the Samaritan woman and he says, or she says to him, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And if you'll turn with me to the rest of John 4, in John 4, 22, he continues. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be worshipers. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is with us everywhere, every single moment. We worship him. We serve him. We have relationship with him in everything we do. In the new covenant, there is not one space where God can be worshipped. Revelation 21, 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He is not just with me. He is not just with you. He is with me a hundred percent, completely holy. He is with you a hundred percent, completely holy. He is omnipresent. He is present everywhere. God is always present yet not always perceived. John sixteen thirty two through 33 says, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. Jesus is talking to his disciples at the Last Supper about what is getting ready to happen to him. He is going to the cross. He tells them, You will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. God, Jesus, must go to the cross alone. His disciples will scatter. And he tells them, Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus tells them, You will leave me when the time comes, but the Father will never leave me. Go with me further. He is on the cross. He is breathing his last breath. And in Mark fifteen thirty four, at that ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice as he died. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? So how can Jesus say that his father God left him? was not in his presence, yet less than 24 hours earlier, he told his disciples, I am not alone for the Father is with me. As human beings, we do not always perceive God is with us. That does not mean he is not. Jesus died on that cross as God, but as a human being. He took our emotions, our feeling, our sin upon him. Jesus had to feel every say, every single emotion that we felt so that he could go in our place. He knew that there are times that we feel God is not with us in the cancer ward, at the grave of a loved one, in depression in pain, in hurt, where we just feel God's not there. Jesus felt that, but God was there. You can be assured God was there. Ladies, I don't know. Gentlemen, I don't know on this side what this looks like. When we get to heaven, Jesus himself will explain this to us. Pour into these scriptures. God's purposes are never thwarted. God is God of all. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. If God indeed did turn his back on Jesus on the cross, that happened so that he would never do that to us. He will never turn his back on his children. If he did to Jesus, that is because he will never do that to us. And Jesus experienced that for us. However, this also could mean that God was fully there with Jesus and Jesus did not perceive his presence because he felt what we felt as a human. 
I don't know. But I go to God and I say, God, these are scriptures that I delve into. These are scriptures that I read. These are scriptures that tell me about your reality. One day you will, you will reveal this to me. But right now, God, I know you are with me. You will never leave me. You will never forsake me because of what Jesus did on the cross. The last attribute is unity. Unity is not what you and I think it is. The original definition for unity means simple. It means undivided. God is not divided. God is not divided into parts. He is simple. We think God is complex. And yes, in our definition of language, but God is completely united. He acts the same through his attributes. Now let me explain that. God is not divided into parts, yet we see different attributes of God emphasized at different times. Exodus 34 says, The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of years, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins. But who will by no means clear the guilty? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Look at all of the attributes God has. He's merciful and gracious. He shows that to us. He manifests us, that to us at different times. It comes to the forefront. He is slow to anger. That means he's patient. He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He keeps his steadfast, patient love for a thousand. He forgives iniquities and transgressions and sins. And yet he's completely just because by no means does he clear the guilty. God is a hundred percent every attribute all the time. He is not love without justice. He is not without justice, without love. He is not merciful without graciousness he is not patient without love god is all love he is simple god is all independence god is all knowledge god is all wrath god is all grace god is all mercy god is all patience god is all freedom god is all blessedness God is all omnipresent, all justice, all at one time. He is not divided. He is not separate. We are, we are finite. We are compartmentalized, not God. All of his attributes, omni, omnipotence, his complete wisdom and knowledge, his truthfulness, his jealousy for his own name, his jealousy to be upheld as God, his holiness, his eternity, all of that, all of that is complete and whole. He is united. He is simple. He is God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this. Thank you so much for teaching us about you. Father, let us take away the distractions and let us see you. Let us begin to see the truth and the reality of your greatness. Oh, Father, I pray abundant blessings on all these that hear and see this that your word would explode in their minds and heart, that they would go to the Bible and read for themselves. And that relationship with you would be deeper 
and deeper. It's in your son's holy name we pray this. 